one of the subject matters of the Advent season not just covers the first coming of our Lord, but it also deals with the second coming. And I want to share as the beginning of the season about the coming of our Lord. What time will he come? When will he come? That's a great question or uh, a question that is asked by many people and, and certainly uh, people want to know if they possibly could the very moment of the hour, but nobody knows as the scripture has been read this morning. But one of the scriptures that I like the most beyond the ones or beside the ones that have been read, we find in 1 Thessalonians, the fourth chapter, where it says, Behold, I show you a mystery we shall, uh, or concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died for our sins and rose again, even them which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For the uh, saying is unto you by the word of the Lord that we which are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. And for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and then the dead in Christ shall rise first, and then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord, and therefore we shall be forever. Then he closes that particular portion of scripture, wherefore comfort one another with these words. Now, I believe that God is speaking to his people as never before in regard to this great Bible truth and the great Bible doctrine. Now, I've been uh, preaching this message of the second coming for 49 years, and, and I believe this great Bible truth. Never in all my 76 years of life have I been so sure that the coming of the Lord is very near. Now I do, I do not know the day nor the hour of his coming. And if a preacher or anybody that's a Bible student were to say, you know, I believe he's going to come next month or this year, pay no attention to that because nobody knows the moment or the hour of his second coming. Only God knows. But if it could be today, it could be tomorrow, it could be this next week. But uh, the Bible instructs us to be ready for in such an hour as you think not the Son of Man coming. I believe the Holy Spirit is touching the hearts of true believers everywhere with the conviction that we are living in the end times. Now, when I say the end times, it has to do with two elements of the second advent. One, which I have read and described from the book of Thessalonians, having to do with the church, the body of Christ being translated, which is called the rapture. Now, many people do not believe that, but the second advent, the literal second advent is when Jesus Christ comes back to this earth, and that's a part of the advent which we believe. Now, I believe the Holy Spirit is preparing the hearts of his people for this departure for that day and hour and moment when the Lord's shout, the archangel's voice will make its sound and the trump of God will be heard. And of course, these stirring proofs transcending all others that our Lord's coming is imminent. Peter states in his second epistle, which has been read, that in the last days men will inquire, where is the promise of his coming? 
This is an up-to-date and current as today's newspapers or tonight's television commentary, even though it was written nearly 2,000 years ago. There's an old Methodist preacher walking along with a uh, young student who was going to become a Methodist minister and start a church. And, and of course, the young student said to the Methodist preacher, he said, you know, I just don't believe the Lord's coming, as the Bible states. And the Methodist preacher began to hold up his hands and shout and said, praise God, people say, will say in the last days there'll be scoffers that do not believe that he is coming. And Peter said that in his own day. There would be scoffers, unbelievers. And if it was near to that day when Paul wrote in Thessalonians, when the apostle Peter wrote in his book about the coming of the Lord, how much imminent it is today after 2,000 years. Paul really believed that the Lord would come back in his day. And he wrote Thessalonians to the Thessalonican assembly to give them comfort for those who were asleep, who had died in the Lord, that all was not lost. And they would be resurrected first, and the, then we would be caught up with them to meet the Lord in the air. In Peter's day, as I said, there were a group of apostates, apostates had the idea that things would continue forever. Nothing would ever change. Maybe things would get worse, and I'm going to describe that in just a moment. They believed that God would not interfere with man's programs and his progress. Peter reminded those scoffers that God has intervened in the affairs of mankind in the past, and they did so in a most convincing way, in a judgmental way, through the universal flood. If you read the story, 2 Peter 3, 5 through 6, in those days of Noah, people did not believe that judgment would fall. They scoffed at the idea when Noah was building the ark. And as he built it, he preached. The Bible says he was a preacher of righteousness. And all of a sudden, that which he preached, the truth came about. It began to rain. The floods came. And the earth and all the things in the earth was destroyed. Now, we have the same thought process today. For men mock and scoff at the very thought of the second coming of Christ or the second advent. Now, I tell you in certain terms, according to the scriptures, the angels and the Son of God himself have already testified the fact that he would come again. In fact, in John 14, we use that scripture many times at funerals. He said that he would come again. He, he has gone to prepare a mansion for us. And if he goes to prepare a mansion, he says, I will surely come again to receive you unto myself. And then, of course, uh, the angels testified the fact that Jesus would come again. As Jesus ascended back to heaven after his death and his uh, uh, walking on this earth for some 40 days uh, amongst the men, as he ascended back, the angels said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into the sky? For this same Jesus which is taken from you will come back in like manner. And Peter reminded all of those in a convincing way. And we have that same thought process. And I tell you, in certain terms, according to the scriptures, that the angels and the Son of God, he's surely coming and soon, suddenly in a twinkling of an eye, one day and soon the great event will take place. Paul mentioned how the change would come about in 1 Corinthians 15. Now, the scripture has a term which is called Maranatha, which means, even so come Lord Jesus. Now, let's think about this just for a moment. The orthodoxy of the church is determined on how we believe the scriptures. If we believe the scriptures to be the inspired word of God, and in 
the orthodoxy uh, is determined by what we believe and how we believe concerning the deity of our Lord, the virgin birth, his death, and his resurrection. But the spirituality of the church is determined by the belief in the second and the soon coming of our Lord. Now, think about this for a moment. If we really believe this truth, that Jesus could come even today or tomorrow or within the next few days or weeks, what more incentive should that be for the church of the living God to try to win souls to the Lord? Because there's multitudes of people around us that's never known the Lord Jesus Christ. And then what more incentive is that from Titus, the blessed hope of the church, for us as church-going people, for us who have been saved, to live more close to the Lord, to be more dedicated to the Lord? What more incentive is there if we really believe that Jesus is coming soon? Does it take a tragedy a terrible thing to happen in our society for our church houses to be filled? I believe if there were to be a tragedy today, it wouldn't affect very many people. Oh, for a week or so after 9-11 happened, there were a lot of people that came out to church because they were in fear of what might happen next. After the wars occurred, church houses were filled with people because of fear and it seemed like church uh, uh, numbers ran over and, and attendance was big. But then after a while, it died down because it got back to normal. Why is that that it takes a tragedy in our society to get people to come to church or to get closer to the Lord? Why? Because they're afraid of what might happen and they want to be right with the Lord. Well, if we really believe that Jesus is coming soon, then church-going people ought to get right with the Lord. Amen? There ought to be a revival within our hearts and lives. Now, so the Bible promises us that Jesus will return to take his faithful followers with him to live with him in his glorious presence forever. Now, According to the scripture, as I've read, everyone else will be left behind to face God's judgment and wrath. Now, there's a lot of people that do not believe that, but they that will be taken will go with him, but the others will be left behind. And if you've ever read the book uh, Left Behind, you'll understand what I'm talking about. And if you believe his writings, Everyone else will be left behind for God's judgment. And if Jesus were to return today, the question is, are you ready for his coming? Now, this is the most important question which you and I will ever answer, except for one other question that was asked by Nicodemus uh, to the Lord. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, this is the blessed hope of the church. Our hope cannot be in circumstances, no matter how badly we want them or how important they are to us. If our hope is only in our circumstances as we define them to be good, as we want them to make us happy, we will always be disappointed if our hope is not in the Lord. That is why we hope in God. God has continually revealed himself to be the God of newness, of possibility, and of redemption. Now, the Bible tells us in the last days that there will be peerless times. I preached on that message a few Sundays ago. It doesn't take a rocket science to look around and understand that things in life are not going to get better as some would hope. There's a doctrine, of, there's a doctrine that many people leave, believe, and they are called post millennials and they believe that the world will get better and better and better and get so good, and then Jesus will come back to this earth to set up his kingdom of peace. That doesn't seem to be taking place, does it? 
Because as we look around, things are getting worse and worse and worse. And then the question is asked, if things are getting so terrible, why does he not come today and just put a stop to all of it? And Peter talks about our Lord being long-suffering. Christ is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And I believe that's the reason God has not already come, judged sinful humanity, and ended history as we know it. Why? Because God is long-suffering toward us. He's not willing that any should perish. And he wants every soul that he can possibly get saved and to come into his kingdom. And that's the program of the church. That's what the church needs to be doing. We think the church is maybe a place where we can come and worship once a week or maybe twice a week or something like that and then go home and say, boy, I feel good because I've been to church. You see, that's not, that's not what the church is all about. The church is about evangelism. And if the church is not winning souls, then there's something wrong. If the church is not increasing, then there's something wrong somewhere. And we need to take a view of what God wants us to do as the body of Christ. Now, in, in the fact that God is long-suffering, it means that we're near to that end of time. He's been long-suffering for a long time. The cup of iniquity is full and running over. And suddenly one day, however, Jesus will come, the Bible says, as a thief in the night. Now, if you've ever had anything stolen from you, like an automobile, you'll understand what I'm talking about. I've had one automobile stolen. Lived in, I lived in Atlanta. And... Uh, uh, we lived in an apartment and our automobile was parked right outside our window where we slept. And we were sitting there watching Andy Griffin. And all of a sudden I heard my car crank up. And I told my wife, I said, that's my car. I'm not in it, you're not in it, who's in it? Well, I ran to the door and I saw my car heading down the street. I called the police and the police sort of laughed at me. He said, listen, you're about the 50th that have called tonight that has cars stolen in this city. But you know what? There was an emptiness that I felt in my heart because, hey, it was my car, it was there a moment, and then the next moment it was gone. That's how thief works. Now, God's long suffering is near to the end. Suddenly one day, Jesus will come as a thief in the night. And he further states that the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and elements shall melt with a fervent heat and the earth as we know it will be burned up. Eventually this earth as we know it will change. All of the things in this earth will make a change because it will be burned with an element of fire. Now, a lot of people after the atomic bomb was invented and dropped on Japan and people became fearful of what might happen in the future if some uh, rogue nation got a hold of the atomic uh, power, how they would destroy mankind. But I want to tell you, the Bible says that God will cleanse this earth by a great atomic fusion, fire, fervent heat. And you say, well, boy, the atomic bomb could do that. It won't man have to do that? No. God spoke this world into existence. All he's got to do is change the routine of how, how the mixture of all these things and combustion happens. God is that powerful. All he's got to do is speak the word and, the, and this earth will be cleansed. Now, do you agree tonight, today, that our world is in a mess and his coming is the only way out? No president, no Congress will ever be able to set things straight. I don't care how much they legislate. I don't care what they do in Washington, D.C. I don't care what they do in Atlanta, Georgia. I don't care what they do wherever in our nation. Man will never be able to set things straight. To pay our unbelievable debt that we're in, 
Deliver us from the horrible pit that we've dug ourselves and others in. The newspapers and televisions are filled with reports of murders and robbers and rapes and child abuse and there's a worldwide convulsion of violence and terrorism. All the signs seem to indicate that something is going to happen soon. Jesus said that there would be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars and upon the earth, the stress of nations and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. The Bible says God is going to shake the earth once more. What kind of mess are we in today? Vampiric immorality? Thank you for joining us for this message from Reverend Wayne McDonald. We would like to take this time to invite you to learn more about our churches by visiting us at calvarycharge.com or by following us on Facebook at Calvary Bethel Centennial. Remember that we are alive together in worship. As Ephesians 2, 4 through 5 says, But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. Thank you.